that here? Okay. Good evening. I'd like to call the Government Operations Committee for Monday, February 6, 2023, to order. <coughs> Roll call, please. Here. 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 Thank you. Uh, we have administrative video gaming statistics, December 2022. Any questions or comments on that? You know, yes, Rita. I do, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know, probably a question for, for Russ. Um, with 26 establishments and more coming, I'm sure, um, I'm wondering who is regularly visiting and communicating with the licensees, uh, making sure they're all in compliance. Is that a regular thing or do we just wait for complaints? Okay, Heather will answer. Yeah, I can at least speak for community development that we um, verify primarily on a complaint basis if we observe issues with signage or items related to zoning, um, but the community <coughs> development is not doing license uh, verification checks. Okay, I, I probably misspoke, sorry. Because I, I, still in my head, I associate licensing with just that, with all the stipulations that go with the license, including signage and whatnot. Again, it, you know, this will be the last time I bring it up, I promise. <laughs> but it just seems not when there's so many who um, are repeat offenders, you know, and um, I'm getting tired of calling, uh, calling about it. Um, but part of me thinks we have so many that are, are in compliance, who've gone above and beyond, who've taken the extra expense, and have done everything to make sure, and then we got, you know, a handful are like, yeah, whatever. You know, so just officially letting you know that I just think it's not fair, and, um, and part of me thinks that they don't appreciate what a gift it is. You know, granted, you know, it's brought to my attention, we made a million dollars in 10 years, <laughs> but it, it's, it's a boondoggle for the businesses, and I, I get the feeling that they don't appreciate what a gift it is, that they just take for granted, and, you know, we have rules, yeah, so what? You know, we're making our money. Anyway, again, I promise I'm done. But that's, I just wanted to once again express my disappointment with all that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, I'm Mr. Bowe. We have two items. Can I have a motion to second, please? So move. move second. By Brian. Second. second by Todd. Uh, roll call, please. Hey, Leitner? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Petrella? Yes. Wordle? Yes. Besner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Calamaris? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. We have 6A, Finance Department. Annual funding request presentation from the St. Charles History Museum in the amount of $50,000 for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Thank you. Um, as the council is aware, committee, we are in the middle of our budget process for fiscal year 23-24. We have two presentations tonight requesting funding from the city. The first one is from the History Museum. Um, President Steve Gibson is here to give a short presentation. They are requesting uh, $50,000, which is the same amount as last year. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce Mr. Gibson. Good evening, committee members. Thank you for this opportunity to come before you Excuse and me. talk a little bit about the History Museum. Name for name. My name is Steve Gibson. Yeah. I live in Geneva. Okay. <laughs> I tried to live in St. Charles. There were no houses available. I'm 100 feet away. All right. Okay. You're forgiven. Yeah. Um, so this evening, it's going to be kind of like last year's presentation. We're going to talk about. We're going to talk about um, our board. First off, we made some changes in the board. I was president last year. I'm still president this year so far. Uh, Mary Lynn Swanson has recently <clears throat> become vice president. She's here this evening. Mike Corbett said he'd come in. I don't know if he did or not. He did. Make it. There you go. Okay, Mike. Uh, Pat Pretz, the secretary, is not here, I don't think. And Tom Anderson, our treasurer. Um, other directors we have on board now, uh, Joyce Cregeer. Uh, John Glenn is here. Uh, Brian Henry is not. He's in Hawaii. Since you send me Maui love, whatever that is. <laughs> Carol Patterson is uh, our education chair. She's not here. Darlene Reby is our fundraising chair. Kathy Brenz and Bob Matson, both members emeritus, are not here this evening. And our city liaison, of course, is Alderman Petrilla. Thank you for your help and support. Um, first off, I'd like to just remind you of the mission of the St. Charles History Museum. 
Our mission is to inspire a curiosity about the past and its impact on the present, specifically in St. Charles, by collecting, preserving, and presenting our unique local heritage. I won't go through reading all the fine print here. You've got it in front of you, and you can read it. But you can see that everything that we do in terms of our mission is focused on some of the same things that the city has always done in terms of its mission. Next, I'd like to go over some of our 2022 accomplishments. Um, one of the things that we're very happy that we got done finally was our enhanced security measures. We now have cameras throughout the building. Um, we had an incident a couple of years ago where some kids jumped off the parking garage onto our roof and played around on the tiles. Um, I hope that won't happen again soon. If they do, we'll have good footage of it at least. Um, we funded additional hours for a collections manager. One of the things that we have is some 15,000 artifacts. Um, those artifacts have to be preserved in a certain way to make sure that they last. Our collections manager, Eric Krupa, is doing that for us right now. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other work he's done over the course of the last year. Um, we've also continued to do our VIP events. And our most recent one, we had Ron Ziegler. His father, Bud Ziegler, was Colonel Baker's right-hand man at the Hotel Baker. Uh, he did a great presentation, talked about what it was like to be a kid in the 1950s. Um, his job was to climb underneath the floor there in the Hotel Baker where the lights were that, under the rainbow room and change all the light bulbs in the middle of the summer while he was off school. So I think he told me there were 5,200 of those bulbs that had to be changed. So I'm sure he was counting each one as he did it. Uh, Radical Souls, the 19th century spiritualists of St. Charles. That's our exhibit that's going on right now. We just reopened it when we reopened the museum on uh, February 4th. Um, that's our latest exhibit. We've had rave reviews from the public. Um, it's interesting um, how it ties into some of our earliest history, including uh, Stevens Jones, who some of you know is the man that came up with the name St. Charles, and Caroline Howard, who was a medium that, here in town who worked with Mary Todd Lincoln in seances after the death of her husband and her son. Uh, we partnered with Pollyanna Brewing again in the month of July, raised money through their uh, sponsored bike rides and uh, trivia night there. We received a $2,500 grant from the St. Charles Kiwanis um, that we use towards children's programming. It makes it nice that we can have children's programming at no cost to the public, um, and that really covers the cost for us. We continued our collaboration with the St. Charles Public Library. We're doing something called Junior Historians. We tape short videos of uh, historical presentations, and then we tie that into some kind of craft project um, for kids and young adults to partake in. Um, we also did our Grave Reminder show. We rotate this show every other year. We either do the History Mystery Restaurant Tour or we do the Grave Reminders at the cemetery. We sold the event out again this year. We had a great attendance. Over 80 people showed up. We had volunteers portraying 12 different historical figures. Um, the following weekend, Steel Beam Theater partnered with us and did a version of that inside the theater for people that couldn't go outside or couldn't make the outside event. Um, and we celebrated It's a Wonderful Life in, seven, in St. Charles, the 70s edition. Uh, this is our second annual gala. Uh, we did it at the St. Charles Country Club on December 9th. Mm -hmm. Our attendance was up by more than 10%, and we exceeded our fundraising goals, so we're very happy about the performance of that event. Oh, by the way, put it on your calendars. The next one is on December 8th. 2023 St. Charles Country Club, okay? Um, some of the things we're going to do this year, hopefully, um, you know, weather and everything else holding up. Uh, we're going to continue to work on our collection. We're going to continue putting things in places so we can find it. We can have it available to do exhibits in the future. We've been pretty successful with our guided walking tours. We did about uh, three of those, uh, three weekends of those each day doing two or three of them. Um, I did a few of those. Um, it is a mile and a half walk. So if you do three of them, I walk four and a half miles and I made all my steps in those days for the first time in about eight years. So um, the uh, return of the History Mystery Restaurant Walk this fall, we're already starting work on that to line up uh, restaurants to be working with us on providing that. Uh, we've been working on some children's programming, including an, an event called Packing for Prairie Life, where we basically show youngsters the things it is that the prairie pioneers brought with them when they came here in the old Conestoga wagons. Uh, Master Gardener, um, uh, uh, Mary Lynn Swanson, who's our vice president, um, has also been working on a special project. We're going to completely revamp the outside landscaping of the museum. We're going to work together with Public Works. The Master Gardeners will be taking care of maintaining some of this for us. But we have all sorts of plans for that. We're going to do um, 1930s plants, um, which kind of ties into the era for when the museum was created. 
We're going to also be something called an eye pollinator, where we'll be actually keeping track of pollinators that visit a special garden that's set up just for that. Um, I think it's going to be kind of exciting, but I think it's going to be a great draw for the uh, public to see that uh, downtown. And then, like I just mentioned, on December 8, 2023, we'll be doing our holiday gala fundraiser again. This year is the 90th anniversary of the museum. We started in 1933, and uh, we're going to try and tie that in. It's also the 100th anniversary for the St. Charles Country Club, so hopefully we'll come up with something for that. Um, this is our, part, our community partners. Um, you can see the people that we work closest with, the people that are really responsible for a lot of our success. And, of course, the city of St. Charles is one of those people that we know we wouldn't be able to do it without. Um, our holiday gala fundraiser, we'll talk a little bit more about that here. Um, it's kind of small, so you can't see the people that I can see in the pictures originally, but if you go to our Facebook page, you can see all these photos. We raised about $27,000. Our attendance was 10% higher than 2021. Uh, we had a lot of fun, um, and uh, I don't think anyone got hurt that I remember, at least. I know my feet were sore. Maybe that was about it. Um, Thanks to the 2022 sponsors for that event. Uh, Kathy Brenz was our presenting sponsor in memory of her husband, Jack Brenz. Uh, State Street Jewelers provided us with a really nice piece of jewelry we auctioned off. Edward Jones, uh, the Lewis, Pollyanna, Mason Faith and Hoshay, Midwest Dental Implantology, and QP on, on Path Financial. Um, thanks to all our volunteers. Um, we've got a limited staff. We've got a, a good core group of people working on the board and stuff. But we really couldn't do it without the volunteers, the people who come out. If you ever want to get out and, and enjoy the community, uh, stop out and see us when we're asking for volunteers, and uh, you'll get to meet some fantastic people. Staff, at the beginning of the year, we had a full-time executive director, and we had a part-time 10 hours per week museum assistant. Our payroll was 84000 At the end of 2022, we still have a full-time executive director position and part-time now 25 hours per week collections manager, and we've upped our budget to 96 k for 2023. Our budget expenses in 2022 were 152000 Our actual expenses were 165000 mostly due to the same things everybody else has run into, which is inflation, and a lot of inflation that we didn't know we would have to deal with, especially when it came to utilities. Uh, we also, because we added the additional hours for our collections manager, that hit our budget towards the end. In 2023, our expense budget were upping to 175000 which includes additional work hours for the collections manager as part of the budget, plus some other things that we're going to be doing. Uh, revenue, our budget in revenue was 154000 Our actual revenue was 173 k That's how you pay for an overage in your, in your expenses. Um, and in 2023, we're actually going to really push the budget, and we're going to push it to 185000 we didn't meet the budget, as I told you before, in 2022 because of the staffing increases we did mid-year, and we had those inflation pressures that everyone kind of knows about. We are going to meet our budget projections in 2023 because we really improved our membership retention. We're seeing our best growth in our VIP members who are really the bulwark of the, the, the museum right now. Uh, we're adding some new benefits for members. We've become reciprocal agreement members with a couple of different groups. Uh, one is entire North American continent and the other one is here in the Fox Valley. Uh, members in our museum will be able to go to other museums in the area at no additional cost and enjoy the benefits as if they were members in, in any number of uh, other museums. Um, we're also going to do even better at our annual holiday gala. We're looking for an even larger turnout this year, and we're planning an even greater um, event for everyone. Uh, and, of course, inflation pressures are easing, and hopefully that's making the forecasting a little less complex. The City of St. Charles is asking for $50,000 for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. That's the same as we asked for last year. And we want to continue to serve the community as we have been for 90 years, and we feel that this is what's important to us in order to maintain our budget. Thank you. Any questions for me? Any questions? Mr. Council, read up. Yeah. Um, a comment and a question. First comment. Groovy, Alderman Besner. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah. <laughs> it was really small in the corner. I hope nobody knows. <laughs> and, and two, um, I heard you talk about you're um, very interested in engaging the next generation. Um, and when I was on the museum board, that was kind of a, a big focus of mine. And I see you got some children's programming. That's great. I'm wondering if there's any um, going to be any return to partnership with D303. Um, funny you mention that. Um, it's my intention that we talk to them. Okay. Um, right now, I'm the acting executive director, and, and children's programming is not my strong suit. Gotcha. Um, I was a child <laughs> once, but I, that's about where it ends. Um, 
I just uh, and the way I think I can do that is to reach out to D303 to partner with me and, and to figure out that. We're also going to work a little bit with the library on some additional programming and partnership with them rather than separate things maybe coming together mm -hmm. being able to do more people. In addition, I've already talked to the Park District, and we're going to partner with them this year during their summer school things, and we'll be having a lot of kids come over and visit the museum and do things like our artifact hunt and great, stuff great. like that. Yeah, I think any time you can get them in the door is wonderful. Oh, but, but I know that it was with my kids, it was like a favorite in third grade when they had their History of St. Charles unit. I mean, got to a point where they were bigger experts than me. And, uh, and I know... For whatever reason, it kind of faded by the, you know, and I appreciate all your programming. I just was wondering. I'm glad to hear you'll have a conversation. Definitely. see if that's back in the... Love to do it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's not our question. I, I mean, I'm uh, in the memo. It says seeking direction. I, do we need to make a motion? I'll move to approve the I'll request. I'll, I'll make I'll the motion to approve. Second. Yep. Dave. Second. Second by Brian. Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, roll call, please. Pay Leitner? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Petrella? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Besser? Yes. Weber? Yes. Calamaris? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. 6B, annual fundraising request presentation from the St. Charles Business Alliance, $698,600 for fiscal year 2023-2024. Thank you. This is our second presentation tonight uh, for the St. Charles Business Alliance. The amount of funding they're requesting is the same amount in total as last year. Um, that would be $265,000 from the anticipated proceeds of SSA 1B and 433600 anticipated from hotel motel taxes from the city's general fund. Um, so I am going to turn this over now to the Alliance and Jenna. Happy to introduce you. Tracy, can I minimize this just to make sure my videos come up? Sorry, guys. No, okay. How do I ask that out of the screen? Okay. Pull those up. Hello. Good evening. Can you have your name for the record, please? Jenna Sawicki. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hello, Chairman Sokaitis and committee. I'm here today to give an up. Oh, okay. Here, give an update on what the St. Charles Business Alliance has accomplished for a 2022-2023 fiscal year. We will show you the ROI for the year, as well as talk about our upcoming goals and plans for the organization. We look forward to continuing to partner with the city to showcase all we have to offer to locals and to visitors. The St. Charles Business Alliance is a DMO that serves the St. Charles community. As the destination marketing organization for St. Charles, we are responsible for promoting a community as an attractive travel destination and enhancing its public image as a vibrant place to live and work. Through the impact of travel, we strengthen the economic position and provide opportunity for people in the community. Here is the Alliance mission, which reads to drive economic growth to make the St. Charles community a destination where people, businesses, and tourism thrive. In front of you is a list of our staff. We are very lucky to have such a talented and passionate team. And here is a list of our current board of directors, which we are also very lucky to have. Here's a listing of our current committees. All of our committees are volunteer driven. These committees meet monthly and have goals set by their chairs at the start of each year. We are able to track our success this way and adapt programming as needed. We're going to start with going over the highlights from our Marketing and Promotions Committee. The committee is chaired by Amanda Stevens, and here's a list of the major accomplishments that the committee has completed during this fiscal year. This includes our work on social media, where we've had over 3.3 million impressions this year. I also wanted to mention our influencer <laughs> program, which we have seen huge benefits from, including our collaboration with influencer Z Marquez, who reached over 470,800 views on her post about her trip to St. Charles. And here's a few more of our accomplishments from the committee. You can see how our newsletter continues to grow and our podcast have reached over 75,800 people on social media. We also worked with local <coughs> photographers to capture and showcase our beautiful community and our marketing efforts. 
and our gifts have reached over 4 million people and counting. Our most engaging medium continues to be video. On this slide, you can see our marketing commercials for this past year. In front of you are some of the statistics of how our top videos have performed. For the year, we totaled over 450,000 impressions. Video marketing brings a valuable human element to our brand. The power that a few moments of video marketing can do is truly unmatched in today's digital world. I do want to show our most recent fall winter commercial, and I'm going to have to back out to do this for one Our website also got a face uh, facelift this year, not only to keep up with the trends, but also to keep up with, uh, keep our website in our top searches and in our demographics algorithm. We worked with local media company to incre increase our SEO, which stands for search engine optimization, and continue to work with website experts and take <coughs> best practices from other DMOs for the format and layout of our site. From the statistics you can see in front of you, we have seen that our efforts are working and our numbers for engagement and continue to increase. I also want to point out the top pages we have on our website. These are important and help uh, guide us on what people are looking for when they are in St. Charles. You will see this reflected on our website and the hierarchy of our website navigation. We want to provide information to the people when they really want it and what they see and do. <coughs> Here's a video GIF of how easy our website is to navigate. In this example, we use restaurants, Italian food, and outdoor dining. However, you can very easily use any keywords um, you want to search our website. Our rule of thumb to improve, improve user engagement is to deliver quality content to the right people at the right time. To achieve better user engagement, we analyze, monitor, and automate. By focusing on the most desired economic drivers, we increase our odds of bringing in visitors. One of our more exciting collaborations was with NBC Chicago Today. St. Charles is highlighted for its outdoor dining, murals, and STC6 beer collaboration. Speaking of murals, this past spring we launched five new interactive murals in the downtown area. These murals continue to bring influencers in and a whole new Instagrammable demographic to discover St. Charles. Then, of course, we launched the Travel St. Charles app. We have found a lot of success with the app and continue to find new ways to collaborate with other community groups and highlight the amazing businesses and culture that we have here in St. Charles. Here are some of the goals for next year for our marketing and promotions. Our focus will be to grow the programs that enhance our mission and help the businesses in the community. Again, we have done our research on who our demographic is and see the trends of what they are interested in. Because of this, we'll be leaning more into ecotourism, wellness tourism, and immersion tourism in the upcoming year. Our organization committee is chaired by Tracy Minnick and is essential to our organization. Outlined in front of you are some of the highlights from the committee. This committee help, helps us maintain and gain volunteers. We held two volunteer recruitment events at Kimmer's Ice Cream and Kuroko Coffee and have another one set for March. And we've planned our volunteer appreciation luncheon and brainstormed new ideas and, and ways to gain sponsorship to our events and to our programming. Our Business Development and Sales Committee is chaired by Sharon O'Leary, and in front of you is a list of the year-end highlights. I'll just pu pull out um, a few of them. Uh, we did a collaboration with the city on a broker tour of our downtown. We've handed out five storefront improvement grants so far this year, which include Boutique Baby, Oak Brook Advanced Aesthetics, Brown Butter, Bakery and Cafe, and Mayon Soap. One of our newest and most successful programs that came out of the committee this year was our Made in St. Charles program. This makers program highlighted six local businesses whose products are made right here in St. Charles. 
Videos were created by our team that you can view on our website and across our social media platforms. These videos have been extremely well re received, shared, and liked. We also launched a tour on our app, and we look forward to growing this program. I do want to show you one of the videos. Our sales team, which falls under our BDS committee, has a lot of accomplishments for the year. Our team did a great job of continuing to build solid relationships with our hotels and within the industry to attract more businesses and meeting planners to St. Charles. They attended national shows and conferences to bring awareness about St. Charles and connect to meeting planners. We sent out a total of 170 RFPs so far and have collaborated with many local businesses, including the industrial industry, and continue to partner with the Park District with incoming sports groups. Outlined in front of you are some of the goals for the sales team for the 2023-2024 year. We will work with our contacts we've made from past shows and upcoming shows to produce strong leads for our hotels. We are also very excited to continue to build our relationships with the commercial brokers in St. Charles. We want to be supportive in helping bring new business that will help make St. Charles even more of a desired destination. Moving on to our events, our events in front of you are a list of the seven large-scale events that we put on throughout the year. Let's start with the Fine Arts Show. The 2022 Fine Arts Show was a great event, and in front of you are some of the stats from the year. We had wonderful foot traffic and positive feedback from both patrons and artists. And here are some of the goals for the 2023 event. There we go. Um, we hope to continue to attract exciting and quality artists that draw in a high-end demographic and continue to connect the visitors to our hotels and to our businesses. STC Live had a very successful summer with 28 performances at 17 different venues. The goal of this event is to create awareness of where you can find St. Charles music locations and also help connect the musicians to the businesses themselves. Our goal for the 2023 summer, um, the goals are listed in front of you with our main objective to help even more businesses and have even more of uh, community-themed or sponsored nights with the industrial connection. Jazz Weekend continued to grow in size and popularity with 27 performances and 15 venues. A lot of businesses benefit from this event and we are thrilled to see how the event has grown in reputation. On this slide, you can see our goals for 2023. We really want to connect more, uh, connect more to the businesses outside of downtown, <coughs> as well as continue our partnership with the Park District Sip and Stroll. Scarecrow Weekend had over 90 community-made scarecrows, 50 specials from local businesses, and was hugely successful for a lot of our downtown businesses. While change can be hard, our mission was seen and accomplished throughout the event. I wanted to showcase just some of the positive feedback that we did receive from the businesses. I wanted to pull out the third quote here um, from Brunch Cafe that says, created a lot of new customers for us. Sales were up against last year. A lot of new faces for us. I think having the Scarecrow on First Street was one of the best ideas ever, and I think this by far was the best event for us so far since being here. Here are some of the goals and changes for 2023. We want to add more entertainment on the same footprint, but also hit our goal of continuing to drive people into our businesses and into our community. Holiday Homecoming was beautiful with amazing weather. We had record crowds at both lighting the light ceremony as well as the parade. 
but most importantly, our businesses saw an increase in commerce and foot traffic during the weekend. For our 2023 event, we plan on making a few tweaks to continue this community family favorite. We will continue to work with the businesses to promote their specials and have even more participation. We have two more events coming up this year before the end of our fiscal year. First up will be St. Charles Restaurant Week, which will be February 20th to the 24th. In front of you are some of the marketing pieces that we are thrilled about. We have over 40 restaurants participating this year, and we are thrilled with the enthusiasm from the restaurants and from the community. And then, of course, we are excited for the 2023 St. Patrick's Day Parade. This event is a huge boost to our restaurants and our entertainment businesses, and we are crossing our fingers for warmer weather than last year. For our funding for the 2023-2024 fiscal year, we are respectfully asking for 100% of the SSA, which is estimated at $265,000 and $400,000. Thank you for ever put that there. And uh, 433600 from the Hotel Motel General Fund. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. Ah. This holds us steady at what we asked for in our previous year, and it is the budget we need to continue to move forward together as a community with our efforts. I hope today I've clearly showed you how we've hit our mission and will continue to accomplish our goals, and at this time I'll take questions and take a drink of water. <laughs> Any questions from the council? Uh, sorry. Okay. I have a question. So first of all, great job. I mean, nice presentation. You guys are clearly involved in everything. There's a lot going on. Yeah. So, um, and I'm not sure. Maybe you don't do <coughs> So when you talk about all these impressions and you talk about the 475,000 views on TikTok, do we ever track that back somehow to the impact it's had in our community financially with our businesses and sales and tourism? Is there a tie back to that marketing, those marketing campaigns and the impact it has here locally? Can you quantify that, I guess? Yes. I mean, yes, in a lot of ways we can. Like we can tell them like how much sponsorship we're getting from the community. If they're participating, they're obviously seeing a um, positive impact on their business, and if our sponsorship continues to go up year over year. We also get a lot of anecdotal feedback from our businesses. So we, after every single event, we send out an email to all of our businesses and say, how is the event for you? How can we do better? And a lot of times we will get feedback that says we were up 10%. I have all that usually included in our packets. I just didn't want to have a 20-minute presentation oh, for sure. you. Sure. But yes, we can like we can we know that our our events and programming are are working in this way. Okay, I appreciate that. The only other comment I would make is as I was going through and looking at the goals, and it's great that you guys have all those goals. It help it helped to have some context to some of those, right? So, if it's 117 RFPs, is that a lot compared to previous years? Yeah. Is it 10 percent increase in patronages for certain fests? Is that is that normal year over year? Are we going up? Are we going down? Like just some general context around what you guys are going after with your goals. So just general comment. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for your presentation. Um, do I need a motion? This correct. The motion is six hundred ninety-eight thousand six hundred dollars. Move for approval. Moved Second. by Brian. Oh, Second by Steve. Yeah. Uh, roll call, please. P. Leitner? Yes. Bondard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Pachola? Yes. Werbal? Yes. Besner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kellner? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. We have 6C, recommendation to approve an ordinance amending Title III Revenue and Finance, Chapter 3.36, <laughs> Homeroom Municipal Retailers and Service Occupation Tax of Zay St. Charles Municipal Code. Good evening again. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a uh, discussion of changes to Title III Revenue and Finance, specifically the Home Rule Municipal Retailers um, and Service Occupation Tax. As the committee recalls, a budget workshop was held on January 23rd discussing items related to the development of the budget for the upcoming fiscal year. One of the items discussed in the workshop was an update of a study recently completed on the condition of the city's 138 miles of streets 
The information from that study showed that the condition of the city streets has deteriorated over the last five years since the last time a study was done. The charts in tonight's packet show the condition of the streets in 2017 and the current condition in 2022. Um, as those charts illustrate, the percentage of streets in the poor to very poor category has significantly increased over the last five years. <clears throat> The uh, impact of this change means that a greater number of streets are going to require some form of significant rehabilitation or reconstruction in order to bring them up to an excellent condition in the future. Uh, for context, too, the, um, the cost to resurface a street is roughly half a million dollars, um, and the cost to reconstruct a street is $1.5 million. So there's a big difference between uh, as a street over time deteriorates, becomes more expensive, more expensive to maintain it, and bring it back up to a satisfactory condition. The city currently has roughly 2.9 million available on an annual basis for road improvements. That consists primarily of the city's motor fuel tax revenues from the state and some monies from the video gaming tax revenue. That funding can vary annually on an annual basis. Um, it can be 2 million, it could be 3.5 million, but the 2.9 is kind of a rough estimate on average. Uh, that expenditure dollar level kind of puts the city on a 50-year cycle for road improvements, and as the study is showing, that's not sufficient to um, keep the city streets maintained at a satisfactory level over time. Uh, what the study that recently was completed came out said that to get to a 30- to 40-year cycle, the city needs to spend about $6.5 million to $7.1 million annually. That's a funding gap of roughly 3 dollars to $4.2 million a year. Um, so when we considered some options available to um, address the additional funding needed um, for city streets and local streets, uh, the city considered a variety of uh, options. Uh, one was an increase in the two-cent local fuel tax. Another one was establishing a 3% natural gas tax, establishing a 1% local food and beverage tax, um, increasing the alcohol tax at 3% currently to um, a different percentage, and increasing property taxes or looking to establish maybe a, a real estate transfer tax by referendum. Um, all those options, um, some of these the city does not have currently, but many cities do. Uh, but many of those options would put the burden mostly on the residents uh, to try and raise that, top, that level of revenue. The one option the city considered and identified as being the most financially impactful was an increase in the local home rule sales tax. This tax is currently at 1% and an increase in that from 1% to 1.5 uh, would generate roughly $4.4 million a year in additional revenue for city roads and related infrastructure. Uh, a couple of things about this tax. Um, it is not applicable to food not prepared for immediate consumption. consumption. So most groceries that you buy at the grocery store, uh, this increase in that tax would not apply to those items. It would not apply to medicine, prescriptions, non-prescription items and it would not apply to the sales of title vehicles, cars, trucks, ATVs, mobile homes as well. One of the other attributes that uh, was viewed favorably with this um, increase is that we estimate that roughly 40% to 60% of the local home real sales tax is currently paid by non-residents. So that was one um, positive thing that we looked at in order to uh, shift you know, the, the burden of that and not have it be all on the residents, but to shift that to more um, of a balance between residents and non-residents. Uh, for context, the tax was established back in 1994 at a quarter percent. It was increased in 1997 to a half percent and increased again in 2004 to the current one percent level. At the budget workshop, it was discussed if a tax of this was implemented, that um, language be written into the ordinance, that the additional revenues would be restricted for streets, bridges, and infrastructure. The ordinance tonight includes language um, in consulting, you know, with staff and the attorney that the definition to encapsulate all the different components necessary in an annual street program, um, the language saying the purpose of funding improvements to the city's road and pedestrian network system, including but not limited to right-of-way improvements and related infrastructure. Uh, one final note on this ordinance that is in front of you. There is the April 1st deadline to implement any changes with the Illinois Department of Revenue in order for a change to be effective July 1st of 2023. And um, after that, the deadline becomes October 1st of January 1st, 2024. City staff was looking to uh, for consideration for implementation um, and 
and budget planning for that July 1st, 2023 deadline. Um, so that's the summary of the ordinance in front of you, and uh, happy to take any questions or comments. Any questions or comments from the council? Steve. No, no questions, just a comment. Um, obviously, you know, one of the things that I uh, enjoy the least is, is ever increasing anything that any resident citizens uh, have to pay, but I also know that it's, you know, one of our jobs, at least, at least from my viewpoint, is to um, take action on things that affect our community down the road and, and in the future. So um, this is something that is, that is necessary based on information that we, that we had, and um, I'm in support of it. Uh, just a comment. I, I think, you know, seeing that our roads, what, 51, 52% of our roads are in poor or very poor condition, um, I think it's long overdue. I think it's time to reinvest in our neighborhoods uh, with the streets, the curbs. I've heard numerous complaints from residents. When is my street going to get done? So um, while I, I really don't like raising taxes on anything, this, I think this makes sense if we can put it in ordinance and put it specifically towards the streets so the residents see improvement uh, with, within their neighborhoods. So I support it. You said we would, the city needs to spend at a rate of six million a year to get caught up. For how long? Um, you know that's a good question. Um, I think it's a long-term uh, project. I think you're looking at a horizon of probably at least 10 years. And at that point, I know that Public Works is looking and willing, in fact, to do another study in say three to five years to kind of see what the con what the condition is and see where it's at. So um, it's a long-term project. Um, there's really not a set set date at this point in time. Any questions or comments from the council? Any public yes. Can I have your name for the record, please? Absolutely. Steve Gaugle, three sixteen Iroquois in the beautiful fourth ward. <laughs> Thank you very much much, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to speak. I'm incredibly concerned about this increase. I'm going to go back to 2018 uh, when a gas tax was proposed in the city and it passed, a two cent a gallon gas tax. At that time, the presentation to the council from our previous finance director was it will amount to $425 to $500,000 a year in revenue, which would be enough to cover the maintenance of the roads and the current condition that they were in. This is 2018, the summer of 2018. You can go back to the meeting minutes and look at that. Here we are now, less than five years later, that 450 or 425 to $500,000 has ballooned to 3.6 to 4.2 in annual expenditures. Before this passes, and before anybody votes yes on this, there has to be an accounting for what happened between 2018 and right now, that a half a million to 4.2 million took a jump in the maintenance. What was the estimate based on back then? Okay. In addition, I, I emailed my, my alderman and a few on the council as well. The city has seen a tremendous increase in revenue from numerous sources. So like in video gaming, which was brought up earlier, and I uh, appreciate Alderman Payleitner bringing that up. Since that's inception, it's been 1.1 million to the city. The gas tax has been 1.9 million since November 1st of 2018. Right? We also have increased the, uh, um, the tax levy by 4.9 million since 2017, and I think we were flat for nine years before that. All of these are increases in revenue to the city. Now, didn't even bring cannabis into this, but that was another 300000 And all this data is on your website, on the state's website. You can see all this. We're looking at cumulative of over $8.2 in new revenue, right, of which 1.9 of it came from the gas tax that was supposed to be put in place to fix the roads and was supposed to be sufficient. I am urging you not to implement this. We just heard from the St. Charles Business Alliance. That half percent is going to put us a half percent over what our neighbors are, Geneva, Batavia, South Elgin, I believe, is at 
uh, where they had three quarters or a half percent, Campton Tools has zero. It's going to make our businesses less competitive. And if we think for one minute this isn't a tax on residents, every St. Charles resident is going to pay this. Every St. Charles resident is going to pay this. You're going to expand beyond, b- b- above and beyond St. Charles residents, but it is a tax on St. Charles residents, much like the gas tax is. I urge you, do not vote this in. Do a significant amount of forensics on how 2018 to now got this desperate from our road conditions and what was the assumptions back in 2018 that now are astronomical. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Chairman, if I could just respond briefly to one point. I know there was a lot of uh, questions and and detail raised in that statement, but uh, the one thing I will point out is with the same item that was discussed at the workshop where we presented a significant amount of financial analysis on why we were proposing the solution. The 2018 pavement study uh, that was presented in 2018 did predict that if we did not start dedicating additional revenue towards this, we were going to end up in the place that we did end up with our street assessment, which is now that 52% of the streets are in poor or very poor condition. So if we do not start doing this, we are going to end up in a worse predicament and then going to have to dedicate a significant amount of money more for reconstructing the streets versus getting on top of it and then going towards a resurfacing and being able to manage that program more effectively with the revenue on hand. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah Any just other real quick. On the residents? Okay, yes, Rita. Oh, can I? Thank you. <laughs> okay, Heather. I heard what you're saying, just a little clarification. Sure. So you're saying that, not that you were here, but you, you know, in 2018, the, um, our surface study that was done, I think we got a copy of it here, um, did predict? That's my understanding, that based on the path that it was being funded at, and Peter, I'll certainly defer to you if you want to add anything additional to that, but that basically that we needed to start allotting more money to that, otherwise we were going to end up in, in a situation where we had a significant amount in that poor, very poor category. Okay, and I kind of remember that too. And I thought that maybe Peter had brought us up to date more currently on what changed in that conversation. And maybe what we had, what Mr. Goggle referred to as that half million that was said to be enough, was that maybe supposed to be enough to be par, but not getting ahead maybe? Is that? Oh, thanks, Bill. Um, one of the things uh, that was discussed when that local fuel tax was established was getting a dedicated funding source for the crack filling and other maintenance, routine maintenance necessary um, to keep to keep the streets, the ones that are in really good condition, and do some of that preventive maintenance on it. So that was to find a dedicated funding source for those activities. So that was the 500000 was for that. Right, 400, 500000 yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is being dedicated towards that program. Right, right. 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 Okay, thank you. It's right. Right. Bill, this probably doesn't go to you, but since you're there, um, is it fair to say that I mean things change and maybe the, the assessment wasn't as accurate as we thought, you know, five six years ago? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables that could impact, you know, a deterioration of conditions over time, weather, use, um, patterns. So um, it's it's definitely you know an estimate at that time, and I think you know, the only thing we can do now is just go with what we, the knowledge and the updated study that we have now. Question. Yes, Rita. Um, as uh, Alderman um, Bunkard will attest to, and I know that the fourth ward, that we have had many complaints on road mm-hmm. conditions. So we know that that's, that's real. <clears throat> and then in the, in the course of the conversation, well, somebody's got to pay for it. And they all say, okay, we'll pay for it. So I appreciate what Mr. Goggle is saying, that the citizens are going to pay. And those with really bad roads are like, Yes, we will. We understand. So um, it's unfortunate, you know, but uh, I think that there's an awareness out there in, in areas that have the bad roads. Yes. Uh, uh, right. I just have a question because I was asked the question, so I'm going to ask you. So there's no way to, to cut our way out of expenses to pay for something this significant without compromising city services, correct? It's, it, that's not practical, is no, that? That's okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was my question. So I think there was one squeaky wheel during the uh, budget workshop, and that was me. So 
I, I get it. You know, this is investment. We're talking about our roads. We're talking about infrastructure. And if we're saying, you know, projected 10 years plus to get caught up to where we need to be, just and this is more of just a, you know, something for the future. Mm-hmm. Budgets change. We have no idea what's around the corner. We have no idea, you know, what issues we might have. Um, I just keeping an open mind for future councils in terms of how this money, where it's being dedicated, you know, the priority, yes, on our roads, on the infrastructure, but, you know, down the line, how you might leverage this to help the community and help, you know, just keeping keeping an open mind. I get that. So, so with all that said, and, and I'm going to vote in favor of it as well, with all the reservations you hear about voting in favor of a tax increase. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is I thought, um, and I always want to say Alderman Goggle, so <laughs> I'm going to say Alderman Goggle. Uh, you know, his points in his email, which I got late this afternoon, I think are good, thought-provoking, and worthy of consideration by staff about how did we get here. And there may be easy responses, there may be hard responses, but I think, you know, um, to take the email and sort of introspectively say, okay, well, what happened? Even though, you know, several of the faces here now weren't here back in 18, I think it's still a worthy exercise. So I would encourage you to not just, you know, rely on the response. You know, one answer is what came from the dais, and that is we're taking a 50-year life cycle and trying to and trying to work to a 30-year life cycle. So with that, there's going to be additional costs that weren't put in place in 2018. That is an example of a response. There's probably several like that, um, but I think it's a worthy thing to look at and think through. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Rita? Steve. Steve, for you, did you send that email by chance to staff? No. No, okay. Okay, well, happily forward it. it oh, you did? Okay. Todd took care of it. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yes, you mentioned the last increase was 20 years ago? 2004, correct. So just something to keep in mind, too. I, you know, we can, we're quick to compare ourselves to other communities, right? What is Geneva doing? But I think it's important... You know, we haven't touched this in 20 years. We're a different community. We have different goals. We have different challenges. But we're, you know, we're on the map and this type of investment going back. So while we don't want to, you know, raise rates at every single turn, there are certain times where our community and our challenges are different than, than others. Okay. We have comments from the audience. Okay, seeing none. Uh, can I have a motion and a second, please? Mm-hmm. I'll move. I'll move by Steve. Second. Second by Todd. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Oh, roll call, please. Pay Leitner? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Petrilla? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Besner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Calamaras? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. This will be in two weeks. We'll be at the City Council for final approval. Okay, we have 7A. Recommendation to approve a resolution authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the State of St. Charles and the St. Charles Park District for the participation in the Intergovernmental Personal Benefit Cooperative. Good evening. Sarah. That's a lot, right? I yeah. know. It. So, thank you. Good evening. The, um, if you may recall, last year this, this uh, council approved a move for the city to move from self insured for its health insurance benefits for employees to a risk management pool, which is the IPBC, what, what you just read. And um, that's been a, a very good move for us. And so this is a pool of municipalities that come together and they leverage their strength to um, get more stable um, financial uh, returns than that they would get in the regular insurance market. And so that's something that the Park District, the St. Charles Park District, is also interested in doing and moving to this same group. And they can do that. However, because of their size, so they have under 150 employees, they would be categorized as a Tier 2 um, uh, member in the IPBC. The city, because we have over 150 employees, we're considered a Tier 3. And the benefit of that is that we are able to maintain the Blue Cross Blue Shield network, which is what our employees have. So it's a seamless transition for our employees. Um, because the park district is, is less than 150, they would not be able to maintain the Blue Cross Blue Shield network, which is what they have right now for their employees. And they can't maintain it um, for uh, until they're there uh, 18 months. And that is not a cooperative rule. That is a Blue Cross Blue Shield rule. 
The way that they can maintain their network is if they come in under the sponsorship of an existing member. So they have um, approached the city and asked if the city would sponsor them and their membership. And um, in the spirit of intergovernment cooperation and, and following one of our strategic goals, I certainly was open to exploring that, provided it didn't cost the city any extra money, it didn't impact our underwriting in terms of when we get our rates, and that if there was no administrative burden. Um, and so we were able to structure the IGA that way, and I, I verified that with the executive director of the IPBC, so they can essentially act as their own member, um, and uh, we can keep our things separate. And then we have a sunset in the IGA also that once they have met the minimum requirements mm -hmm. by Blue Cross Blue Shield, they would transition out and become a member of, of their own. So this would only last for about 18 months. So it won't cost us anything. It won't be anything in terms of administrative burden uh, for our finance department or our HR department. And it's, it's just a good opportunity for us to work together with one of our uh, partners. This IGA has been reviewed by their uh, attorney as well as the city attorney, and uh, it needs to go before this, this board, it needs to go before their board, and then it needs to go before the board for the IPBC. So I am recommending that uh, we sponsor the park district so they can become a member. Any questions? Steve, I have a question. Does this, uh, does this help save the park district any money by doing this? The as I understand, their motivation is to save money. I believe that they're fully insured right now and that they are anticipating quite a uh, rate hike from Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, yeah, this would I ideally help help save our citizens. I like create a bigger pool, right? Mm -hmm. It's better for them? Exactly. Okay. Any other questions from the council? Seeing none, can I have a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Second. Moved by Ed, seconded by Brian. Uh, roll call, please. Pam Lightner? Yes. Bongard? Yes. Bancroft? Yes. Petrella? Yes. Werbaum? Yes. Besner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Calamara? Yes. Thank you. That motion does pass. Um, any comments from the council or audience staff? Okay. I do. Yes, please. No public comment. I see. I'm just going in order, Mr. Chairman. Okay. No public comment, correct? Correct. No okay. <laughs> Great. I just want to follow up from the last meeting. At our last meeting, I had asked, um, you know, uh, if we could have a conversation to discuss um, our ethics ordinance, whether or not it needed to be updated or looked at. And um, and I want to thank Heather for um, sending out the requested information, and then she looked for um, input from us. Um, and while I'm disappointed that seven of my colleagues and the mayor chose to not have that conversation, um, so we're not. Uh, it's not a hill I choose to die on. <laughs> uh, I personally don't think the optics are great on that decision, but so be it. Maybe another time you'll see, see fit. And uh, to former Alderman Stilato, I try. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, can I have a motion and a to adjourn? So moved by Weber. Moved by Steve. Second. Second. Second by Bill. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Okay. Was that quite cool? <laughs> you better. You better. better. You better. 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 Okay. No, you do so much there, Brian. We get to leave. Come the wall. All righty. All righty. Have a good rest of your evening. Have a good rest of your evening.